discussion on faith, a bit more about faith to tell you. And today I even went to the um, bother of making enough photocopies. In my head, last time I made 45, so you would each share with one person, but I neglected to tell anyone that was my plan. So I just totally ran out. I don't know what I was thinking. It was really funny. All right, great. Um, I'm just going to open in prayer, and uh, we'll get going then. Father in heaven, we thank you um, that we can come here as your people and your worshipers. We pray that um, as we think about our faith and what that means and kind of how to work on that, we pray, Lord, you'd speak to each of us individually so we could hear what kinds of things you want us to tweak. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified in our time here today and in the discussion time with the students. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah, nice. You got it. Okay. Um, do you know, it, it's sort of funny. Uh, my, my homiletics prof years ago, the, the t- uh, preaching class prof, um, said to us, name the sermon titles and general topics for the last five messages you've heard. And we all thought, and we were all seminary students, we were very serious. And I had preached the last times that I'd been in church, and I could not remember for the life of me even the general topic of what I had done. And I, I knew it was in Ephesians, but like four and five, we had no idea. But you know what we do remember is illustrations. And I remember this illustration. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's by a guy named Ken Davis. Ken Davis is a youth speaker uh, from years ago. And he was talking about his uh, college physics class. He was giving a, a lecture or like a uh, student presentation in his college physics class. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, the, the talk was on the law of the pendulum swinging back and forthy thing, law of the pendulum, right? So he spent 20 minutes explaining how if you hold a pendulum up and release it, it'll never come up to its original spot because of friction on the rope, because of gravity, because of air resistance, etc. It'll never come up to the point you released it. It can only get close to that unless you've pushed it a little bit or something like that. And to illustrate it, he took a kid's toy, like a little top or something, and he attached a piece of chalk to it, and uh, he tied it to a string on the blackboard, and he raised it up so that it would go, you know, tied to the blackboard there, and let it go. And it would swing back and forth, and the chalk would make a little mark as it was going, and sure enough, it became apparent it was not coming all the way up to the place of its original. This, is, this gets a lot better. So the place of its original release. Polite applause from the crowd. And then his prof was at the back and he gets up and he's moving forward. And he said, oh, wait, wait. We're not done yet. In fact, he was only getting started. In the middle of the lecture hall was this weird bag. It was a parachute. And in the parachute was 250 pounds of metal weights held to the top of the lecture hall by parachute cord, 500 pound parachute cord. And so he asked his prof to oblige him and backed him all the way up to, let's imagine this is it, backed him all the way up to the cement wall of the lecture hall. Put a chair there and made sure his head was resting against the cement wall. And then he went and he grabbed the parachute full of metal weights and hauled it all the way up to the guy's nose and said, "Uh, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And the guy's like, yeah. And then he let it go. Now, What I remember from what he said was that as it went out, it made a swooshing sound. Swoosh. 
And <laughs> you know, it is way up, it's tied way up there. And so it swooshes out. And then it starts to come back. He says, I never saw anyone move so fast. This guy just bailed. He was out. And the illustration is, it's tough being a professor. <laughs> We've got it rough, all right? So don't do no tricks to my office this year, kids, because I'm expelling some of you to do that. Great. Yeah. No, really, I mean, did, did he believe it? I mean, the law of the pendulum, did he believe it? Yes, he believes it. But do you believe it? No. Not when my nose is on the line. You know, that's another level of believing it. That's real life belief. That's what I want to get to, really. So, um, last time we, we talked about um, what faith was. I just wanted to give some quick definitions of faith. Just rapid fire. Some faith definitions at you guys today. What is faith? It's linked to obedience. So much uh, of the time in the Bible, when they talk about faith, they're actually talking about acts of faith. They're, they're not going inside and like, how are you feeling as much? I'm not discounting feelings, as we'll see in a moment. And I talked about that last week. But often when they talk about faith, they're, they're kind of going in the direction of you doing stuff. Like pulling the trigger on showing up to Bible school. That would be an act of faith. That's one of the reasons why I like teaching here, is because you've all really shown an act of faith by coming here, and I think it has an effect on you. I think that's one of the reasons people change here, is just the initial act of coming here is, a, is an act of faith itself. Uh, it's a relationship with God that flows both ways, and we'll see more about that in a second. Um, it's also beyond making myself feel better by cut. I just wanted to put this in here. Um, maybe this is kind of youth group level, but it's, it's beyond making myself feel better by cutting down those whose spiritual lives are even worse than mine. So I was a minister in a small town uh, in southern Manitoba for a few years, and this was the game. This was, this was huge. They really... If I could see that you had done something wrong, I could talk to my friend about it and I could feel better about what you, I could feel better about myself because of what you had done wrong. Um, it doesn't function in isolation from my other gauges. So I, I know it seems like um, staying in good condition, eating well, staying emotionally refreshed, being emotionally healthy, dealing with the, the challenges in my, in my heart are unrelated to my spiritual life. I could just pray more, and then I would fix it, but it's, it's not. We're not three separate beings. We're one being, aren't we? So these are all related. This is I, My spiritual, emotional, and physical lives are connected with one another, and that's who I am. Um, this is one that I, I wanted to bring out a little bit, and I, I don't think I'd talk about this uh, the rest of this time, which is that my, my faith is related to how much I use my spiritual gifts. Some of the times I felt closest to God have been act, after I've done some kind of act of service that I know I did well at. That, I, that was in my giftedness and that I had prepped well for and I was ready for and went well. And all of that was at the same time part of God using me and empowering me. So it wasn't God empowers me and I'm totally in some area that I'm terrible at. It's more that God will empower you in an area that he's already gifted you for. And there was something in that that's a spiritual connection. This is especially true for those of us who have as our spiritual path, as our path to God, service, acts of service. So for some of us, this is going to be big for you. You're really going to find that your acts of service, you just sense much more of a connection to God. So pay attention to that if that's you. And ironically, right at the end here, even though we're doing a lecture on faith, little is said in the Bible about how to build it. There's no big how to build faith chapter. There's lots of examples. But it's, you know, it's funny. It's not as spelled out as you might imagine it to be. It's more the Bible is filled with stories and examples of people displaying faith rather than Step two, step three of how I can live in faith. <clears throat> Having said that, we're going to attempt that. 
how do I, how do I get closer to God? How do I increase in my faith? Well, one, one thing is sort of what we're doing here. We, we use our minds. Um, getting closer to God by understanding him more, by understanding the nuances of his desires and who he is. And I don't even mean just intellectually. I mean that knowing someone takes time. God desires justice, love, kindness, and life even more than we do. He invented those things and he has a perfect understanding of them. The thing is, if we think in our hearts, if in our heart of hearts we think of God as miserly or in any way unwilling to answer prayer, it will diminish our faith. And so we have to explore what we really believe about God. That may not always be just in theology. I mean, we'll we'll teach you things about God, but what you believe is in your heart is often different than that, and then you need to explore that. Who would want to pray to a grumpy God anyhow? If you think God is kind of grumpy and unhappy, who would pray to him? Secondly, we need to pursue a deeper relationship with him. I know that sounds very general. Um, It makes it more natural to call upon God for help if we talk to him. It's kind of like um, when, when you were a kid, you just spent a lot of time with your mom. And so asking mom for help was pretty normal. And in my life now, I actually don't talk to my mother very much. She's just kind of busy. Um, She puts her cell phone in the drawer a lot, and it loses its charge completely. So often all her messages are filled up. That's just who she is. But those who are close to God when they ask him for something or talk to him about something, that's quite natural because when we're close to someone, we see them all the time, it's quite normal to talk to them. And because God is a person, we can cultivate a relationship with him like we can cultivate it with any person, that we can, we can know him. I have a weird example of this today that I'm going to pull out of the book of Jonah. So... Um, As you might remember about the book of Jonah, the prophet was commanded to go to the hated enemy of Israel, uh, a land called Assyria, and to preach to one of their key cities that they should repent. And if they didn't repent, the city was going to be destroyed. And, of course, you know the rest of the story. He tried to get out of it, but he was uh, eventually deposited at the place where he needed to go. He preached in that great city, and um, he was successful. Everybody repented. And it was weird, because we didn't, it's like, well, uh, good, everything's done. But instead, we kind of follow the prophet (laughs) a little bit more, and look into his personal life. And he is not happy about this. Of course, he tried to get away from it all. And uh, he's not happy about the result, even though he felt it was kind of predetermined. And he's watching to see what's going to happen. You feel like he's sort of lurking, you know, in the bushes. What's going on with that city? Where's the fire? Bring the fire. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's all waiting for that. He's like, oh, okay, this is not happening. It's, God's changed his plans. All those is one of the weirdest prayers in the Bible. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to angry and filled with an unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. If you think some of the prayers uh, about some of the prayers of the leaders of the Bible, you might think of David dancing before the Lord in the Psalms, or opposite, um, destroyed before the Lord, feeling as though he's dead as his enemies surrounded him. He kind of went from one emotion to the other. You could think about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet praying for God to rescue Israel, but knowing that they were doomed. Or Isaiah in that throne room, 
I'm sure you're going to hear that um, lecture about this again in the throne room of God. And he's kind of overwhelmed by the very presence of God. Here, Jonah has just gone through something. The, the enemy of his people was about to have their capital city destroyed, and instead they were spared. And instead of being overwhelmed or joyful or sad or asking for help, he, he points at God and he says the weirdest thing. In essence, he says, I know you. I know you. I know what you're like. I know how you work. You were always going to have compassion on these people. This was always going to work out if they repented. In fact, he doesn't say this, but because he left right away, you get the feeling that he knows this was all going to happen anyhow. That if he went there, they were going to repent and they were going to be forgiven. So this time, I'm bailing. I'm, I'm just getting on a ship and leaving. That's really funny. But I know that you're going to do that. And God just lets him say that. If they repented, you would have mercy on them. I bet you set this whole thing up exactly in this way. I think that's a weird accusation to make of God, especially in the presence of God, that we would assume he's almighty and all-knowing. But I think because Jonah was so close to God, he didn't just know things about God. He didn't just know things in as much as I know things from reading about God or I, I have a sense of it. But he, he knew God like you would know your mom. There's just things that your mom would do and you know she's going to do them beforehand. You just know what's going to happen. That's because you know her so well. This is the, this is the area of faith. It's, it's not so much a, a faith I learn about in Bible college or I learn about in a really good lecture. It's kind of a, it's kind of a combo of stuff I've, I've read, stuff I've learned, stuff I've seen in the world, stuff I see in your lives and the lives of others, stuff I see in my heart and my life. And it all comes together just as as my knowledge of my mother does, and it mushes together in a sense of the person. And Jonah was at that point, even though he prayed in a very weird way about that. He was upset about something, but he knew God. We can see God working in front of us, and that teaches about who he's like and, and who he is. I think I'll skip down to the, the conclusion here. I think as I grow closer to God, sometimes there's an expectation that I will know I'm closer to God because everything's going to go well for me. Do you sense that? That's, that's lived out in a, in a belief system called uh, the, the Word of Faith movement, sometimes called Health and Wealth or the Prosperity Gospel. And the, the base teaching is, if I'm close to God, he's going to reward me with, among other things, money or good feelings or physical health. And that's, that's when I know I'm in the right spot. And if I'm not there, if I'm not healthy, if I'm not wealthy, and assumedly if I'm not happy, then I'm to blame. My faith isn't very good. Interestingly, this is not what we find in the Bible. Uh, the Apostle Paul is on his way to spread the word and spends a day and the night in the deep talks about himself being perplexed and destroyed, and yet close to God in that same moment. It's not as though he was a Jonah going somewhere else, you know, trying to get away. Um, I had a really interesting uh, illustration of this the other day. I went to GPAC about two weeks ago, and uh, they have this thing where you, uh, in the section of the church, because it's a big church, in the section of the church you're sitting in, everyone around you, you kind of were supposed to visit with them for a few minutes after church, right? That's the deal. And you know me, I don't like to dirty myself with people too much, but I felt like I should go along with it uh, a bit there. Kim was around, and I, he might spot me heading for the exit too quickly, and I can't have that. So, uh, so I, I was chatting with the uh, couple next to me 
Uh, the guy was, um, he was, his name was Andre. He was from uh, the old Soviet Union, is how he described where he was from, right? And so when the Soviet Union fell, um, he joined a mission organization planting churches in the country. And he was there for a while. And then he got transferred to Germany with the same organization. He actually taught in a Bible school for about five years. He taught evangelism, uh, among other subjects. It's kind of neat to talk to him about because he didn't come across that way. It didn't feel like he, he was, uh, you know, particularly well-educated. But, um, you know, he did that. And then he went to, he came to Vancouver. He came over to Canada after that. And he planted two churches in Vancouver. And then casually mentioned that he also had two heart attacks during that time. He said, because of all the stress, the expectations and the stress. And then after that, he came up to uh, Grand Prairie and he worked as in safety in the oil field and mentioned that it's been really slow lately. And it, but he said, um, you know, it's so much more peaceful when I'm not working in ministry. He said, because when you're not in ministry, you're not under attack. Not in the same way. When you're doing stuff from God, this is what my old youth leader said. My old youth leader said, the closer you get to God, the closer the devil gets to you. And uh, Andre said, you know, of course, he, he had been in ministry in various ministries for many years and said, that was my sense. Anytime I would drop out and kind of do secular work for a while, life would kind of just be easier, right, emotionally. God is after faithfulness despite the circumstances of your life. His, his key goal is not giving you happy feelings. Faith is not primarily me feeling good about stuff. I think God gives peace. I think he gives strength in the midst of trial. And there are times of peace, but it doesn't always go so smoothly. That is not a measure of how everything is going. Even in the midst of those difficult times, we are still in the center of God. We can still be in the center of God's will, and he wishes us to continue going. I'm going to close in prayer and then let you take your question sheets and do your thing. Father in heaven, we thank you for um, the chance to be here, and we just pray, God, now as uh, the students head off to... Um, this discipleship time, that your spirit would be there and that you'd give guidance in Jesus' name.